We are so excited that you're here. Welcome. There's so much to share. Our goal today is to give you a taste of what's available for your audience. The excellent programs that you can get from around the country without travel expense. We know live programs won't go away. Live programs will always be in need. We want to bring folks into the library. We work for libraries, but virtual is here to stay. Virtual is reaching people, connecting, and engaging them to the library and all the library has to offer. Virtual is expanding and reaching new audiences. And for myself, I remember the moment I realized that virtual was here to stay. You see, I was online with 67 people with the library. Now for some libraries that might be small, this library was tickled pink. You see, the thing was, it was a surprise, unexpected snowstorm. And we were chatting after the program, the librarian and I, and she said, with this situation, the room may have been entirely empty. Yet there we were with 67. Just two weeks ago, I was talking to the director of the Glen Ellen Historical Society in Glen Ellen, Illinois. They've decided COVID or no COVID going forward, doing virtual this coming season to keep their membership engaged. Today, we've gathered for you some of the best of the best in virtual presenters. So you can see for yourself just what your audience will see. Today, we have William Pack perception deception expert, Brian Rose, film and TV historian, Marie Limpert and Anne-Marie Brogan discovering the magic of organized living, Leslie Goddard, scholar and actor, Chris Villillo presenting history through music, Claire Evans presenting UK themed talks, and me, educational entertainer, Martina Matizen. We're going to jump right in and begin with William Pack. William Pack spent much of his summers as a child hanging around his local library with free access to books. He discovered a voracious desire to read everything. He uses this passionate curiosity to create a diverse collection of programs, including biography, history, and science. William's performing and communication skills have elevated his programs, making him one of the most in-demand presenters in the market. Please welcome William Pack. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming out. I am a William Pack, and we're going to talk a little bit about uh, some of my science programs today, uh, including Mind Games, the Science of Perception Deception. Now, here's the thing. Uh, this is uh, a cognitive science brain health program. And in there, I'm gonna talk about how our brain works. Now it started because I am a professional magician. That's me getting out of the straitjacket in my Houdini program. And I knew for years that I was using science and psychology to fool people. I didn't know what it was. Or I didn't even know how it worked. I just knew that it did work. Uh, so I began studying these kinds of things to maybe even figure out if I could make better magic tricks. That hasn't happened yet. But what has happened is I found out all sorts of things about my brain, your brain, that is, are amazing and sometimes disturbing. So let's talk about a few things here. Uh, one of the things I cover in there is what's called Gestalt theory. And if you're a graphic artist, you know exactly what Gestalt theory is. Uh, but it's kind of uh, the tools that our brain uses, the shortcuts our brain uses in order to understand the world better. Uh, let's talk about one in specifically. And this is called closure. Now take a look at this image on the screen. When most people look at it, they perceive it as a square, a white square overlapping four black circles. That's not what's there though. It's actually four circles that have a quarter missing from it. But because our brain hates incompleteness, it adds lines where lines don't exist and shadowing even to make it almost a three-dimensional picture. I'm gonna show you, I use a lot of optical illusions in order to show you how your brain works. And to do this, uh, for example, this checkerboard illusion, it's one of my absolute favorite optical illusions. Now square A and square B are exactly the same color. And most people, when, when I can see them, look at me like I'm crazy when I say this. But here's what's going on in your brain. Your brain is using context and experience to figure out the scene. 
you know that the square should be alternating colors. So B should be a lighter color. Your brain sees that shadow that the cylinder is casting over it. It start, starts subtracting out that shadow to make it the color that it wants it to be. Now I'm gonna show you a video of this and you're gonna see your brain adjusting for the shadow in real time. Now you see square B under the shadow is light. Take it out of the shadow and it turns to its actual color because your brain doesn't need to adjust for the shadow anymore and it turns dark. Now these types of optical illusions are, uh, show us that our brain isn't telling us the world that it is, it's a world that it thinks is useful to us. This is unconscious and something we can't override. And it also leads to a lot of other cognitive different different kinds of cognitive things and how we can be manipulated by advertising and marketeers and such. For example, here's a quick one. Well-designed restaurant menus have all sorts of tricks to make you spend money the way they want you to spend. So for example, just one, if you put a box around an item, it will raise the sales of that item by 20%. So why does a restaurant want to put a box around an item? Well, that's one of their highest profit items. Now, the Mind Games 1 was so popular that I actually created a Mind Games 2 program. It's the science of curious thinking. And it also, it kind of reviews, it's a standalone program, and it kind of reviews some of the things, but it takes us deeper in our, our pattern-seeking ability. We are pattern-seeking animals. In fact, the most important pattern of all is the human face, which is why we see faces everywhere. And using things like our pattern-seeking and gestalt theory, uh, we can finish things that exist. So for example, uh, if you were to look at this, you might think it says jumping to conclusions. But that's something when our pattern seeking abilities get a little too uh, enthusiastic because we often jump to conclusions that aren't correct as to what is really in front of us. This leads us to uh, believe in superstitions, conspiracy theories, and I talk about how and why that happens. Now, new this year, again, because Mind Games 2 was so popular, I created, don't forget, the science of memory. And I'm going to talk to you about how memory really works and how we know it works. And ground zero for this is patient HM. Well, he had terrible seizures. And he went to a doctor, Dr. William Scoville, who was a brilliant surgeon. He went to him to try and go into his brain and see if he could stop those seizures. Well, it turned out that William Scoville was also a, lobo a lobotomy enthusiast. And he thought you could solve many of your problems by just cutting out certain parts of your brain. And because of that, patient HM lost the ability to create new memories. And he's ground zero for our understanding of uh, how our memory works. I also take you, uh, all these things are very interactive. I take you through what's called the Mandela effect. Uh, for example, uh, take a guess right now, uh, one or two, which do you think is the correct Fruit of the Loom logo? I give you a second to think about it. And if you pick number two, you are correct. But most people, the vast majority of people I've done this for think number one with the cornucopia is, but it's never had a cornucopia in it. Or for example, the, the Monopoly Man, which is the correct Monopoly Man, one or two? Well, it's one. He's never had a monocle. And that's just a quirk of our memory kind of sticking some, some things together there. I'll also talk about memory techniques that the championship of memory people use to, to remember thousands of items. Uh, but most of those aren't really practical for real life. Uh, so I'm gonna show you some real life examples. Chunking is something you probably do. So for example, you need to remember a string of numbers. Well, we could only fit about five to nine things in our short-term memory. But if we chunk them, like putting them together in a sequence like this, we can remember them much easier. In fact, this is my phone number if you need to call me instead of sending me an email. And it's easier to remember like this than just a long string of numbers. 
At the end of each one of these programs, I talk about brain health. Most of it goes with this quote, the day you stop learning is the day you begin to cane. In fact, even in the short time we've been together, you may have learned something, which means I've made your brain stronger. You're welcome. But I also tie all the different things into uh, library resources. Uh, so for example, uh, people who are bilingual and use both languages often save out the effects of dementia longer. And I know most libraries have an app which they can teach people how to do a different language. So those are my programs. Uh, thank you for joining me and uh, we'll head back to uh, Martina and the rest of the program. Thanks, William Pack. All of his programs are entertaining and packed with interesting content. His interactive presentations will cause your audience to, to think, talk, and wonder. Take down his contact information to connect with William Pack about a program for your library. You see, the program performers here today are not part of an agency, but a collection of presenters who excel in the virtual space. We've gathered together to make finding experienced, prepared presenters easy for you. Next, Martina Matiz, an educational entertainer, presents Meet Mae West. Mae West shattered box office records and public sensibilities her one-liners scandalized the censors, yet made her an icon. Meet the woman behind the wit. Who was Mae West really? Your audience will find out in this fun and interactive presentation by Martina Matizan. My name is Mae West. I started small time, ended big time. The fun was all the middle and between. Today, I'll take you with me to visit old vaudeville, the Broadway stage, the golden age of Hollywood. And if you're good, we'll meet a few stars. No, well, I'll bet you're good. When you're good, you're very good. When you're bad, you're better. <laughs> Say, do you like my dress? I've always said those are what <laughs> it's better to be looked over than it is to be overlooked. Besides, I don't worry about diets. The only carrots that interest me are the ones you get in a diamond. <laughs> I uh, generally avoid temptation unless I can't resist it. Let's get on with this presentation. I hope you don't find it too shocking. Maybe you will. Those who are easily shocked should be shocked more often. I was born in Brooklyn. I don't remember the year. Brooklyn of my time, beautiful. Tree-lined streets plagued with horses and a brand new bridge to Manhattan. The people, well, they dress fine. The men wax in their English guardsmen mustaches. I like a man in a mustache. I like a man without a mustache. I like what a man does under his mustache. I've always said a man's kiss is his signature. The main man in my young life, my father, they call him Batlin Jack, a boxer he was, king of our neighborhood. By the time I came along, he was selling carriages. Mother and I would ride in the finest carriages in town right before they were sold. My mother, Matilda, her friends call her Tilly, my mother sharing my every joy and success. There was a time I was uh, 17 years old. I drank some hooch. I came home and was rude to my mother. The episode upset me to such a degree I never drank again. You might see me drinking in the moving pictures, but in real life, I don't touch the stuff. Poison it is. I've seen it ruin people. Life is full of enough troubles. Why drink your own? Now, I started my career on the vaudeville stage at the tender age of seven. Vaudeville, it's light entertainment. 10 to 15 individual acts put together for a show. Why, you could see everything on the vaudeville stage. Magicians, singers, dancers, 
You could see trained animal acts, comedians, jugglers, acrobats. They were all put together by this fella here. This is Tony Pasta. Now in his time, entertainment was highbrow, the ballet, opera, or burlesque, not respectable. Tony put together family shows, calling it vaudeville, to such success. By 1880, he had his own theater. By 1890, vaudeville is all over the country. Vaudeville players are big. They're so big that to this day, in your modern rocket era, you'll still be able to name a couple of vaudeville players. So go ahead, enter in the chat. Don't be shy. Let your fingers fly over the keyboard and tell me a name or two of these uh, vaudeville players. And I'll give you a hint. The girl was part of a song act with a sing with her sisters. They were the gum sisters. They called themselves the gumdrops. She was the youngest. So who belongs to these fresh faces? Enter it in the chat for me right now. Christy got it. <laughs> Christy. Christy got it. Mickey Rooney and Judy Garland. Now I have one more little admission to make. You see, when I wear the uh, hat of Mae West, I do think the thoughts of Mae West, but you see, when I take the hat off, why then, <laughs> then I become just plain old Martina. Again, I'm an educational entertainer and it's my delight to be able to present for your audiences. My job is to help you build a virtual audience. And how do we do that? By engaging and connecting and interacting with your audience. We want them to know this isn't TV. This is for them. I do other characters and some libraries may have seen Meet Marie Antoinette. Chicago, true stories of the 1920s. And you can enter yes in the chat if you happen to have seen Edith Head, the woman who dressed Hollywood. Cleopatra, the last pharaoh of Egypt. She's not who you thought. And one, two, three, four, five, six wives of Henry VIII. Now, there's one more hat that I wear. Well, not so much a hat, but another costume, you see. Professional garb, because I also work for libraries as a speaker and <laughs> as a trainer. And I do wear professional clothing for that. I'd like to give you a super brief one minute showing of what the virtual program feels like. How do we make virtual training a good experience with interactivity? Make it fun and engaging for your staff by opening a dialogue with them, by making it relevant content that can be applied today and keeping it fresh. This is not TV. The training is not pre-recorded. It's a live experience in real time for your staff. In other words, <laughs> not boring. If we're going to do virtual, let's use the format to really connect and engage with your team. My topic, the body language of customer service. And body language, not so that you can say, aha, now I know what you're really thinking. No, it's for ourselves so that we can be better understood. You see, offering a superior customer service experience is about communication and awareness. That's where working knowledge of body language comes in. Customer service is really relationship building. A relationship begins when your staff knows how to effectively communicate. My topic customer service training with a fun twist. Thank you for sending my contact information to your director, assistant director, whoever sets up your professional development programs. Now it's time to jot down my number and contact me directly for educational entertainment or training.
Now, me and all my outfits are going to watch the other presenters dazzle you with their offerings. We're all performers and presenters who want to help you build your virtual audience. Also, everyone who's registered today will get a tutorial on how to open a virtual program and how to close a virtual program. Up next, Brian Rose, a professor emeritus at Fordham University, where he taught for 38 years in the Department of Communication and Media Studies. He's written several books on television history and cultural programming. Brian Rose has conducted more than 100 Q&As with leading directors, actors, and writers for the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, the Screen Actors Guild, the British Academy of Film and Television Arts, and the Directors Guild of America. Brian has presented lectures on film and TV history throughout the country, including at the Smithsonian. Welcome everyone, Brian Rose. Like most people, I love stories about Hollywood and television. And as Martina told you, I decided to make it my life's work and become a professor of film and TV history at Fordham, where I taught for nearly 40 years. Since the pandemic, I've been presenting Zoom talks all over the country, which look at a wide variety of film and television topics. For movie-loving audiences, I've got a number of lectures, which I guarantee are going to uh, intrigue and uh, inform your audience. Let me open up my Zoom talk now and uh, show you what my topics are. My talk on the golden age of Hollywood is a good place to start since it looks at the movie business in the 1930s and 40s when the industry was at its peak from classic gangster films like Little Caesar to the most profitable movie ever made if you take inflation into account, Gone with the Wind. From there, I offer a number of talks about the way Hollywood operates, from the star system to the history of movie censorship, which goes all the way back to the Hayes Code and up to today's movie rating system. One of my favorite topics is movie musicals, and in my talk, From the Jazz Singer to A Star is Born, I trace their history all the way from Al Jolson to Lady Gaga. To my mind, the greatest musical performer is Fred Astaire, which is why I created a talk focused entirely on his amazing career, which spanned four decades. In over two dozen excerpts, I think I make a pretty good case that Astaire's magic is just as potent today as it was when it first appeared on the big screen in 1933. I've always loved movie comedy all the way back to the silent era, which is why I put together my presentation, Make Them Laugh. that starts with Chaplin and Buster Keaton and moves on to all of the great comedians of the sound era, including the Marx Brothers, W.C. Fields and Laurel and Hardy. Continuing in the comedy vein, the most popular talk I've ever presented looks at these two guys, Carl Reiner and Mel Brooks, and their amazing seven-decade career and friendship, which began with their work together on Sid Caesar's Your Show of Shows and continued all the way through to Toy Story 4. I think your audiences will also enjoy spending time with my look at rock and roll and the movies, which offers a rock and memory trip with Bill Haley and the Comets in Rock Around the Clock to the Beatles in A Hard Day's Night. I've also got a few presentations which look at individual filmmakers. One examines my favorite director, Alfred Hitchcock, who I taught a course on for 30 years at Fordham. Another looks at two of the most influential filmmakers of the last 50 years, Steven Spielberg and George Lucas, and how their films including Jaws and Star Wars, changed Hollywood and created the modern blockbuster movie. In addition to the big screen, I also have nearly a dozen talks focusing on the small screen, starting with the golden age of television from the 1950s to the early 1960s, which examines well, looks at Sid Caesar, the Army McCarthy hearings, and the quiz show scandals. 
This was a fascinating time in television history when TV was just beginning. And in my presentation, and now a word from our sponsor, I take a deeper look at what TV advertising was like in these early years when commercials were often live and sometimes integrated directly into the program. These first decades of television were also a time when the medium discovered rock music. And in my talk, Rock and TV, I try to bring this era alive with some fabulous clips of Elvis Presley's first appearances on TV, along with Ricky Nelson, the Supremes, the Beatles, and yes, the Monkees. Television has changed so much over the decades, and these changes are reflected in a variety of ways. In my lecture on the history of TV news, I go all the way back to Huntley Brinkley and Walter Cronkite and show how TV journalism developed from the introduction of news magazines like 60 Minutes to the revolution of all news cable networks like CNN, MSNBC, and Fox News. And though it started out as primarily a light-hearted way to end the day, the television talk show has also been transformed in recent times into a pointed and often controversial arena for political conversation. As I examine in my lecture, from Carson to Oprah to Stephen Colbert, a history of the TV talk show. On a less serious note, my presentation on the history of TV comedy looks at the many ways television has made us laugh over the decades. Looking at everyone from Milton Berle, Lucille Ball, Jackie Gleason, Mary Tyler Moore, and Jerry Seinfeld. Finally, I have two presentations for audiences that may want a deeper understanding of the incredible ways technology has transformed our lives. The first is called The Changing Face of Television and explains how YouTube, Netflix, and Disney Plus have basically made the simple act of watching TV a lot more rewarding and complicated. The second, how the internet changed everything, looks at the digital revolution and its decisive impact on everything from newspapers, radio, the music business, and home entertainment. I do my best to cover a lot of material in my Zoom talks, complete with hundreds of images and dozens of video clips. I think you and your audience will find them interesting, informative, and entertaining. Contact me to arrange a date for your library. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Contact him directly for a date with your library. As the idea of this showcase was blooming, I was reaching out to a group I worked with in Boston, asking who was one of their favorite virtual presenters. Brian Rose's name came up as one their people ask for over and over. All of the presenters and performers that are here today for you have each come recommended by programming librarians and have a significant body of virtual work. Combined, we have over 1,500 virtual presentations. Our next presenters are a dynamic organizing duo from Long Island, New York. Anne-Marie Brogan and Marie Limpert, they're professional organizers and co-authors of the book, Beyond Tidy, Declutter Your Mind and Discover the Magic of Organized Living. The virtual programs they bring to your library patron combines personalized organizing strategies with the science of positive psychology. Their passion is to help others regain control of their space, schedule, and stuff. Their mission is to educate, motivate, and inspire people to be active creators of a home and life they love. Please welcome Anne-Marie Brogan and Marie Limpert of Organize Me of New York. Thank you, Martina. Good morning, everyone. I'm Anne Marie, and this is Marie. Hi, everybody. And we are excited for this opportunity to share how our virtual organizing programs can enrich the lives of your patrons. People look at Pinterest and either believe organizing is out of their reach or they set unrealistic goals which lead to feelings of frustration and failure. 
our mission is to dispel the notion that some people are born with an organizing gene and others aren't. We take the science of positive psychology, which includes productivity, habit formation, motivation, and resilience, and merge it with our powerful organizing principles, all in a fun and easy to understand format. Based on the material in Beyond Tidy, we have created four informative and engaging programs that will both educate and inspire your patrons. They are jam-packed with great organizing strategies sprinkled with the ways to help develop a positive growth mindset. They will keep your patrons solution focused and motivated to tackle any organizing clutter project. Our fun-loving and non-judgmental approach helps everyone feel at ease and realize that they are not alone. In each presentation, we show you how organized living saves you time, money, space, and energy. We not only explain what to do, but why we are asking you to do it and how it will impact you. The best part is after each program, attendees will be able to start implementing our strategies and tips right away. Our four presentations are five, our five basic principles, for getting and staying organized, what stays and what goes, an organizer's guide to making decisions, where's my stuff, the ins and outs of managing space, and how to manage your paper without losing your mind. So let's take a quick look at each one. The first is five basic principles. This is our signature presentation, focusing on mindset and behavior we teach five powerful organizing concepts and provide solutions to common challenges that get people stuck. The next is what stays and what goes. People often struggle when making decisions on what to keep or let go. Here, we inspire attendees to look at their space and their things differently. And we provide detailed action steps for making the process easier and less overwhelming. Decision-making is a pain point for many people. We tackle it head on with compassion and respect. The next is our newest presentation, Where's My Stuff? This focuses solely on our organizing principle of managing your space so you can manage your inventory. We take a really deep dive, teaching your patrons unique and creative strategies for maximizing space and staying in control of their belongings. And last, but certainly not least, is managing your paper. Here, we give your patrons techniques on how to easily manage incoming mail and address paperwork that has piled up. We teach them how to create a command center for handling short-term active paperwork and how to uh, handle long-term filing at any organizing level, including the simplest filing system you will ever see. To read more about each presentation, Marie has added the link to our presentations page in the chat. If you click on it, it should open right in your browser. So how do we keep the audience engaged? We have carefully constructed each organizing program to include a variety of different learning modalities. We have well organized, we are, sorry, we have well organized and appealing visuals. We use a mix of slides, photos, and videos to change up the learning process. We encourage interaction and participation through the chat and polling features, as well as during our Q&A. This leads to more self-awareness and also reassures people that they are not alone. We provide a safe, supportive, and judgment-free space in which to learn. The audience often expresses what resonates with them using the chat feature and during the Q&A. They have aha moments and feel like finally someone understands them and gets what they are feeling. Of course, none of this would matter if our content wasn't valuable. Our presentations are designed to be more than just informative. They are meant to inspire motivate and provide tangible action steps your patrons can use right away. So why hire us? Well, first of all, we're very organized. So we are very easy to work with. 
We provide everything you need to promote the program, including graphics and copy, and we come very well prepared. We use our own Zoom account. So if you prefer, we can run the program independently. This is particularly valuable for some libraries who are short staffed and may not have the luxury of time to host or even attend the presentation. We're fun. We always show up with a truckload of positive energy and we work hard to create an environment where your patrons feel at ease and safe. Our programs are unique. We don't just teach about the mechanics of organizing. We talk about how organization and disorganization impacts our energy, relationships, anxiety levels, confidence, and so much more. The strategies we offer are based on our 15 years of experience, supported by science, and presented in a way that is accessible and easy to implement. We provide added value through our Q&A at the end, where we hang out to answer any organizing questions your patrons have. Some even use this time as a chance to just vent about their, their own overwhelm. We talk about real life challenges your patrons are facing. It's added value we include to foster connection and community. We have presented close to 100 virtual programs throughout the Long Island library systems. We are grateful that so many libraries have contracted us multiple times because they are very happy and confident with both our high quality content and the experience of working with us. They have also shared our program information with fellow libraries. We have amassed a loyal following of viewers who look forward to our informative programs and very often will register with other libraries so that they can view the same program again. We love that we have those groupies. Our presentations are, are based on our book, Beyond Tidy. It is available in hardcover, digital, and audiobook versions, and libraries often buy the book to lend out to their patrons. Here is our contact information. We would love to connect with you and answer any questions you may have. Thank you for being here and happy organizing. <laughs> wow, wouldn't you just love to spend time with that organizing dynamic duo? It's time to jot down their contact information for Anne-Marie and Marie to discover the magic of organized living. Remember, organize me of NY, that part's important. Each presenter here offers several virtual programs for you to choose, organize me included. As a matter of fact, most libraries who do the first program then request the other three to continue the practices that they teach. With the presenters here today, you could actually book a top quality program for your library twice a month for a year. You can focus on outreach, knowing your presenters are top notch and ready to deliver value to your audience. Next, Leslie Goddard. Leslie Goddard, PhD, is an award-winning scholar, actress, who has been portraying great women in history for more than 20 years. She holds an interdisciplinary PhD from Northwestern University, as well as a master's degree and an undergraduate degree in theater. A former museum director, she currently works full-time as an actress, public speaker, and author, recognized as one of the top historical performers working today. Her portrayals have been seen by audiences in more than 35 states, including scores of universities, museums, libraries, civic organizations, and Chautauqua festivals. Welcome, Leslie Goddard. Oh. Welcome, and I'm so delighted all of you have stopped in. This is my little cottage Val Kill. Now, uh, let's see, you probably don't want to talk about anything unpleasant. You probably would like to hear about my husband Franklin's triumph over polio. This was in the summer of 1921. We were all up at our little summer cottage, Valkyll, uh, um, that little Campobello Island, and we had all spent the day out sailing, and it was very hot. And we had spent some time putting out a fire on a local island. We were all very tired. So Franklin and the children ran to the other side of the island where there was a swimming hole. And then they all ran back and 
Still wearing his wet bathing suit, Franklin sat down to read the day's mail, which had arrived. And as it was getting close to supper time, he stood up and he said he did not feel well. He did not want any supper. He was going upstairs to lie down. That was the last time he walked upstairs himself. Because by the next morning, he could hardly stand. And by the morning after that, he could not stand at all. Well, of course, we sent for the doctor who thought it was a cold with some sort of muscular thing. And then another very well-known doctor came up from Bar Harbor, I believe. And he also was mystified. He couldn't imagine what this was. Finally, after this had gone on for a week or 10 days, I received a telephone call from Franklin's uncle saying, he thought Franklin should be examined by a specialist in polio. Infantile paralysis? This was an entirely new idea to me, but I said, yes, of course. So this doctor came up, examined him, and at once pronounced it polio. I think in a way, Franklin was relieved to finally know what this mysterious ailment was. But he never said a word. He just immediately began working, trying to get his muscles back. In fact, it seems to me, I can recall his saying once, it was only a question of whether you live long enough. If you did, he was quite sure you could get your muscles back. I, of course, wanted to be useful. I wanted very much to help him out, so I began going to meetings and giving speeches. I have always said, you must do the thing you think you cannot do. And I discovered we made a good team. Well, I knew all about social conditions, probably more than Franklin did. But Franklin knew politics and how you can use politics to bring about the changes you like. We really began to develop a teamwork. However, I did not dream of the White House. I knew what would traditionally lie before me, the teas and receptions. And well, I cannot say I was entirely pleased at that prospect. When Franklin was elected in 1932, the turmoil in my heart was rather great. In fact, I think I was a rebellious first lady at first. For instance, I was told, first ladies do not operate the elevator themselves. I said to the head usher, I do not have time to wait for someone to come from the front door every time I want to go up and down stairs. This created a great deal of consternation at first, but finally I was allowed to run the elevator, which was quite an emancipation. <laughs> now I'm going to stop at this moment because what I want to do, if you don't mind, is to take off my hat and to take off my identity as Eleanor Roosevelt so I can tell you just a little bit about myself, Leslie Goddard. I am, as you heard, I have a background both in history and in theater. So I bring together both of those backgrounds when I do my portrayals. I do not only do Eleanor Roosevelt, I do a number of different women specifically focusing on 20th century American women. I do Amelia Earhart, I do Jackie Kennedy. I'm working right now on a new portrayal of Julia Child, which I'm really excited about. And I do some characters who are specific for certain times of year. For example, I do a portrayal of Rachel Carson, the environmentalist, which is great for April for Earth Month. Uh, I do a portrayal of Lizzie Borden, the accused axe murderer. That's great for October, for Halloween time. And the great thing about portrayals is they can be in the person's actual location. What you're seeing behind me is an actual image of Eleanor Roosevelt's cottage at Valkill. She said at one point, 
The chairs in my house are like the people who visit me here, mismatched and uneven, but we can all settle in comfortably together. I do also do lectures, uh, again, focusing on my interest in American women's history and in popular culture. So for example, I have a great lecture on Betty Crocker, who sadly was not real. I hope I'm not destroying anyone's cherished beliefs on that, but she did just turn 100 years old last year. I do a lecture on the history of Nancy Drew. I have some really fun Christmas programs. I do a program on mid-century Christmas trends like aluminum Christmas trees. And do you remember those giant light bulbs that would fall off everything? Um, I do some things on Chicago history since I'm based in the Chicago area. I wrote a book on the history of Marshall Fields. I wrote a book on uh, the history of the Chicago candy industry. I do talks on Riverview Park, a lot of fun things like that. Um, I hope very much if you're interested in history that you think this is a fun way to do history because I absolutely think it is. If you're interested in seeing a live virtual performance of mine, a full length version, you can go onto my website, which is very easy to remember. Uh, I'll type it in right now. It is lesliegoddard.info. I know it's just going to come up on the screen, right? Uh, if you have uh, any time, you can go to my website. There's a calendar page and you can see the full calendar of upcoming events I've got. Many of them are virtual, so you can take a look and watch a whole program. Thanks so much for joining us today. I hope you're getting some great ideas because I certainly am. Martina, back to you. Thanks, Leslie. Didn't you all feel like you just spent a few minutes with Eleanor Roosevelt. This is such a fun way to learn about history and your folks will love it too. Write down Leslie Goddard's contact information and reach her directly to have Eleanor Roosevelt and those other historical women visit your patrons. Leslie Goddard has been a consummate performer for many years and I want you to know that each of our presenters today have met standards of excellence just to be here to present to you this morning. As Leslie said in our promo, the best way to build an audience for virtual programs is with excellent programs. The other advantage of working with pros is to be stress-free for you as a programmer. Up next, we have Chris Villillo. Chris Villillo is an award-winning singer-songwriter, roots musician, and folklorist who weaves original and traditional songs and narratives into compelling, entertaining portraits of the Midwest. A master of bottleneck slide guitar, he weaves original, contemporary, and traditional songs into a compelling and entertaining portrait of the history and lifestyle of America. In the mid 80s, he was involved in documenting the last of the pre-radio generation of rural musicians in Illinois. His one-man show, Abraham Lincoln in Song, received the endorsement of the Abraham Lincoln Bicentennial Commission. And the accompanying CD charted in number 10 on Billboard's Bluegrass album chart in March. Introducing Chris Valillo. Thank you, Martina. And what a pleasure it is to be here with you folks today. Now, today I'll be doing excerpts from one of a series of shows that I use of historical music and storytelling style narrative to explore a subject. Today's show, Abraham Lincoln in Song. They say that April the 14th, 1865 was a beautiful day in Washington, D.C. Spring was in full bloom and peace had finally come to the war-torn nation. That afternoon as Abraham and Mary Lincoln went for their carriage ride in the countryside surrounding Washington, why they held hands and they seemed cheerful for the first time in years. And you know, friends, as Abraham enjoyed that beautiful spring afternoon, a curious thing began to happen. He began to cast his mind back over the years and speak to Mary of this, this long and difficult journey that brought them both to this unique moment in American history. 
Now for Lincoln, the journey began 56 years earlier. February the 12th, 1809, when he came into the world at a dirt floored log cabin on the big south fork of Nolan's Creek, way down in Kentucky. Two years later, his father Thomas moves the family 10 miles away to a spot right on the Louisville-Nashville Turnpike, and it is here that a young and inquisitive Abraham first hears stories of the lands beyond. Wild tales of exaggeration, of a new garden of Eden, flowing with milk and honey. He heard stories of prairie grasses, they said, that were taller than a man on horseback. Oceans of blue iris as far as the eye could see, and soil. Young Abraham heard stories of soil they said that was so rich and fertile, why heck a man didn't even have to plow it up to plant a crop. Oh no. All you got to do is grab a handful of corn kernels, throw them down at the ground, but friends you better jump back because the ears would spring forth full grown and knock a man clean over. He wasn't careful. Well, of course, all these exaggerations inspired countless new pioneers to light off for these lands. And right about that time, this song was written preserving many of those exaggerations. A song that Abraham would later say was one of his favorites. Way down upon the Wabash, such a land was never known. If Adam had crossed over it, why, this land he'd surely own. He'd say, this is the garden he lived in when he was a boy and he'd straightway pronounce it even in the state of illinois so move your families westward and bring all your girls and boys and cross the shawnee ferry to the state of illinois why it was here that the queen of sheba came with Solomon of old, with wagon loads of spices, pomegranates and fine gold. Ah, but when she saw this lovely land, why her heart was filled with such joy. Straightway said she, I'd like to be the queen of Illinois. So move your families westward, good health he will enjoy and rise to wealth and honor in the state of Illinois. Now let's move forward in time. In 1837, Abraham Lincoln has become a lawyer, and he is working the 8th Judicial Circuit, traveling with 25 other lawyers in search of work. Now, the lawyers are a gregarious lot. They love jokes and pranks and tall tales, and of course, music. And their favorite song of all was a, a simple pioneer melody called Who's and Johnny that had a, a wonderful sing-along chorus all the lawyers would join in on. I'd like to play that for you here today, but I want to do it on an instrument that Abraham Lincoln himself played at this time. The Jews harp, jaw harp, mouth harp, frog, fiddle, snoopy harp, Arkansas harp, goo-gaw, gee or as I call it, the Tennessee Tooth Trasher. <laughs> Little black bull come down the meadow. Who's in Johnny? Who's in Johnny? That little black bull come down the meadow a long time ago. Long time ago. Long time ago. That little black bull come down the meadow a long time ago. First he jump and then he beller. Who's in Johnny? Who's in Johnny? First he jump and then he beller a long time ago. Long time ago, long time ago. First he jump and then he beller a long time ago. <laughs> the Tennessee Tooth Trash. Now, 
The story continues through Lincoln's lifetime using specific pieces of historic material music-wise that I can directly relate to Lincoln. Songs like Lincoln and Liberty, We Are Coming, Father Abram. I also include stories that Lincoln told himself and his own quotations. Uh, I do a wide range of unusual musical instruments to hold the audience's attention. The jaw harp, for instance, or this 140-year-old hammer dulcimer, which I use to illustrate the time when Abraham meets Miss Mary Todd at a dance in Springfield, Illinois. It's said that he was so nervous he walked up to her and said, Ma'am, I would like to dance with you in the very worst way. And then he proceeded to do that very thing. Sound too bad for being 140 years old, does it? Now, the full show runs an hour and 15 minutes, but there is a 50 minute version that takes you from Lincoln's birth up to his rise to the presidency. I also have a series of 10 pre recorded five minute videos called Abraham Lincoln Shorts that have one song plus the historical connection to Lincoln and some back history on the instruments that I'm playing. I do a wide range of programming using this musical format including shows on the songs of the civil rights music, uh, the uh, music of Stephen Foster, and even the poetry of Carl Sandburg. You can learn more about my shows on my website, chrisvalillo.com, and I hope to see you sometime soon. Thank you very much. Back to you, Martina. Such a musical talent, Chris Valillo. Hey, Chris, I wonder if lawyers in Illinois still sing that song when they get together. <laughs> I don't Take know. Time. <laughs> Take time, y'all, to write down Chris's contact information to delight your patrons. Reach him directly. You know, when this first group first gathered, Chris Valillo quickly made the short list. You see, music is particularly difficult to mic for sound in a virtual program. Chris was helping musicians around the country learn to mic properly at the beginning of the COVID shutdowns. So many musicians were scrambling to understand this new way to perform. Chris stepped up to help. Sound is essential to a good virtual program, and I'll add, not always easy to find with musical programs. With Chris Villillo, you can depend on excellence as you can with each performer today. Now our final presenter, are you ready? Claire Evans. Claire Evans is a former journalist, attorney, and college lecturer who started her love of most things British as she and her mother watched countless Britcoms on PBS. She went on to study abroad in London and against all odds, she married a Brit. She met in Peoria, Illinois. They moved to England where they lived for a number of years. She spins fun and educational talks from her visits to British historical sites and addiction to British television. Here's what one librarian she bribed had to say about her. Attending one of Claire's programs is like enjoying a cup of good English tea with a well-informed and fascinating friend. Her presentations are unique, professionally delivered, with just enough curiosities that leave audience members feeling like insiders, offering intelligent and delightful presentations and delightful to work with. Claire delivers exceptional experiences. Enjoy, Claire Evans. Hi, I'm Claire Evans. Uh, so it's a pleasure to be with you here today. As for me, one of my life's large twists was when I mar married a Brit and I moved to the UK. So we live in the States now, uh, but I still like to chat about my years on the island. So I have spun my love of British history and culture into UK theme talks, uh, peppered with my personal experiences. So back then, I did not really uh, appreciate the comedy gold of, for instance, when I kept pulling the red light cord in public toilets and wondering why first responders showed up. Well, that was the emergency call signal. Or uh, the horror of learning that my oven in my little English house worked on something called gas mark. 
works. Oh boy. Well, uh, so those are the sorts of things that I pepper into my talks, and I'll give you a few highlights. But before I do, um, have a look. This is a little trivia question, if you might know. Any chance you have an idea where this is? Is it a trip question? Hmm, have a look then, have a think. If you know, you can pop it in the chat or just think on it yourself. So one last look. Ah, it's very Caribbean, isn't it? Or is it? Well, some of my favorite things to talk about are topics where US and UK culture intersect. Uh, namely, in my Downton Abbey and Uptown Girls talk, from Uptown Girls to Downton Abbey, about Gilded Age heiresses and how they went over to marry the British aristocracy. And I think between the new Downton film and the Gilded Age on HBO Max, Americans will always be a bit obsessed with royalty and, uh, and aristocrats in the UK circles. Libraries have put together really lovely events where I'm on a big screen and they've opted to serve in-person tea and they've had scones and they've had me virtual for people who prefer to attend that way. So I think that's a great idea if you're looking for something special. And one of my favorite talks to give is about Mary Anning. Uh, she has been called the world's first female paleontologist. I found her story quite by accident at my local shopping mall. It began there anyway. I was amazed that when I went shopping that I could work, walk on fossils called ammonites and belemnites. And I found out they came from an area of England called its Jurassic Coast, which is one of the world's leading fossil hunting areas. So off we went to a little town called Lyme Regis, which happened to be Mary Anning's hometown. And we took a fossil walk with a geologist and I was hooked. I found it really difficult to find even the simplest of fossils, but Mary found this complete skeleton of an ichthyosaur when she was just 13 years old. Self-taught, she knew more about uh, paleontology than the academics who came calling uh, to use her for information. And in fact, Darwin could not have written his On the Origin of Species without her finds. Uh, out of poverty, she continued to sell her fossils and she was invisible to all of those who stole the credit. So she is certainly an unsung hero of science. She's great for Women's History Month in March, or the International Day for Women and Girls in Science in February, or even for National Fossil Day in October. Lyme Regis in particular is a beautiful place on the south coast of England, so it's a nice one for travel programming too. Then, besides Mary Anning, I translate traditional British baking and share a bit of my kitchen drama in the Great British Baking Tour. And we certainly tour around the UK with that theme in mind, which is inspired by the Great British Baking Show that aired here on PBS and Netflix too. This month, brand new talk uh, starting Britain's Hidden Treasures, which is about ordinary people who have discovered truly extraordinary things underfoot. In fact, we used to go to dinner with the man who found the Roman villa that you see being excavated, and it hit world news last November, but they're not telling the secret location quite yet. Popular for Harry Potter's birthday or Halloween is my talk, Pottering Around the UK, uh, about the film's various locations, where I pick apart the architectural mishmash that is Hogwarts and show you the real buildings that inspired it, as well as some of the most beautiful exterior locations like Leadenhall Market in London for Diagon Alley's exteriors. And then we come to tea, the politics of tea in particular, a story of smugglers and drug running, all for the love of a dead plant. And there, in fact, is the smuggler himself named Robert Fortune. He was a Victorian plant hunter, and he risked his life to make sure that all the tea indeed was not in China. Into travel, well, the beautiful scenery of Cornwall is perfect for armchair travel. It's a ancient mining county that's in the very extreme southwest of England. It's also legendary home to King Arthur and his castle at Tintagel. Throughout its history, it's been known for smugglers, records, pirates, and pole dark. So here's the answer. If you didn't know, this is England, not the Caribbean. This is a place called Kynance Cove, and it's on a spot very south in Cornwall called the Lizard. Are you amazed England can look like this? When I saw it for the first time, I didn't know what, where I was. It's transformative. So for the holidays, there's also a holiday version of my Great British Baking Tour, uh, where I share my personal experience of how not to flame your Christmas pudding. 
And then, a sneak preview, I'm almost off to Yorkshire at the end of this month uh, to research veterinarian Alf White, better known as James Harriet, author of the series All Creatures Great and Small. Uh, there's been a popular TV reboot, in fact, that the Guardian newspaper of London said, this is the quote, switching it on was the equivalent of taking your brain out and dunking it into a bucket of warm tea. And I assure you, if you're a Brit, this is like a spa day. Uh, so PBS airs this series typically after the first of the year, so that's when I'm planning the, the talk to be. If you have anything that you, uh, sounds intriguing for your patrons, uh, this is the best way to reach me. I have a website, if you can remember my name spelled C-L-A-I-R-E, teamwithclaire.com. Uh, backslash events are all of my listings. There's more that I didn't tell you about. And you can also email me. It's claire.e123 at yahoo.com. Uh, my presentations last about an hour. So I'll come back to you. And if you think that your patrons might enjoy a fun escape to the best and the most interesting parts of the UK, I'd love to hear from you. So thanks for watching and I'll offer it back to you. Thanks, Claire. I'm in the mood for a cup of tea in an episode of Downton Abbey now. Claire's is the very last number for you to write down. Contact her directly for fascinating talks of all things UK. The comments that come in after Claire's virtual talks that come into your inbox will inspire you to have her back again and again when you read, she made my day and please book her again. And the speech was exceptional. When that comes into your inbox, you know the feeling of a job well done. Well, that wraps it up for us today. Thank you for joining us. This showcase has been recorded. We'll send you a copy. Please forward it to anyone in your circles that you think might benefit. Now, remember, this is intended for professionals like you, not for the general audiences. So uh, decide who you think you might like to send a copy to. You'll also receive two tutorials, how to open a virtual program and how to close a virtual program. Offering virtual or hybrid programming with your live programming is the future of community outreach, and we are so happy to be a part of it. Thank you all for joining us today.